I'm going to uh, introduce the panel today. Welcome to the festival. The, welcome to the tw 2023 Tucson Festival of Books. This panel, Visual Thinking and the Art of Perception, will end in one hour. Please save your questions for the panelists until after all of them have spoken. We'll have 15 or 20 minutes for questions, so lots of time for questions today. I'm Mary Frances O'Connor. I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Psychology uh, and uh, a neuroscientist, so I am just so excited about this panel today. The festival organizers thank the William and Mary Ross Foundation, the University of Arizona Facilities Management, for sponsoring this location and Rebecca Part Potter and the Arizona Daily Star for sponsoring the upcoming discussion. Make sure to stop by the book sales area and author signing after the session. That will be on the mall. Book sales at the festival help support the cost of the festival and the local literacy program it funds. You can also help keep this event free and open to everyone by becoming a friend of the festival or a sponsor of the festival please stop by the Friends booth or by going online to tucsonfestivalofbooks.org. And as we begin today, if you would just silence your phone, it will make it easier for everyone to concentrate. Just take a peek. We have two amazing panelists today. Uh, Temple Grandin is a, professor, is a professor of animal science at Colorado State University, a renowned animal behaviorist, inventor, and autism activist. She has had a successful career consulting both on livestock handling equipment design and animal welfare. Temple writes that when she was young, she was considered weird and teased and bullied in high school. The only place she had friends was activities where there was a short in shared interest, such as horses, or electronics, or model rockets. She had the goal of becoming a scientist, and today, half the cattle in the United States are handled in facilities that she has designed. Temple has a number of books including Navigating Autism, Nine Mindsets for Helping Kids on the Spectrum with co-author Deborah Moore. And most recently, this book, Visual Thinking, The Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and, Abstra and Abstractions, published in October 2022. Before we uh, turn to Temple, though, I'd also like to introduce Amy Herman. <laughs> is a lawyer and with a JD and also has a uh, master's in art history. She uses works of art to sharpen observation, analysis, and communication skills by showing people how to look closely at painting, sculpture, and photography. She helps them hone their visual intelligence to recognize the most pertinent and useful information as well as recognize biases that impede decision making. Her book, Visual Intelligence, Sharpen Your Perception, Change Your Life, was published in May 2016 and was on both the New York Times and Washington Post bestsellers list. Her most recent book, Smart, Use Your Eyes to Boost Your Brain, was published in October 2022. And I can tell you, both of these books are absolutely fantastic and made you see the world differently. So, welcome to both of our panelists. I'm going to start with some questions. And Temple, I'm going to start with a question for you. Temple, you make a distinction between different kinds of visual thinking. Can you help us to understand the difference between object visualizers who think in pictures and spatial visualizers who think in patterns? Yes, yeah, so I'm an object visualizer. Everything I think about as a, is a picture. 
Now this helped me in designing equipment, understanding animals. In fact, art and mechanics actually tend to go together. Now, optic visualizers have a lot of problems with abstract math such as algebra. And when I was out working on equipment design, I worked with brilliant optic visualizers who worked in the shop, who could not do algebra, barely graduated from high school, but they had lots of patents. Often on the spectrum, lots of patents. So the optic visualizer thinks completely in pictures. The visual spatial mathematical patterns. One is pictures, the other is patterns. So music and math tend to go together. And there's research that shows that these different kinds of thinking, two types of visualization exist. And there's a whole chapter in my book, Visual Thinking, on the research that shows that these are two different kinds of thinking. And in working with big food processing plants, the people in the shop make the clever mechanical equipment. And the university trained engineer, boilers, refrigeration, wind load, we actually have a huge skill loss in object visualization. There's stuff we no longer make, such as the state-of-the-art electronic chip making machine and poultry processing plant equipment. It's from Holland. Thank you. I found this distinction, this distinction to be very helpful. And then it made me think about, in your book, you talk about these collaborations between spatial thinkers and object thinkers, the scientist and the engineer, or the architect and the contractor. Can you tell us some of these great collaborations and how they work by benefiting from both kinds of thinking? Well, they're complementary skills. I already mentioned this about the food processing plant. The degree engineers do not invent mechanically clever equipment. I know another guy who made specialized hydraulic equipment, selling it around the world, barely graduated from high school, and it took a single shop class. And one of the big problems now is he took all the shop classes out of the schools, mm. so these kids don't have a chance to excel. In writing visual thinking, visual thinking is associative, it's not linear. So I looked at the rough drafts of the chapter, and Betsy Lerner, my wonderful verbal co-author, she smoothed everything out, she also added things to it. So that's another example of verbal thinker working with a visual object visualizer and using the skills in a complementary manner. That's, that's, that's exactly, what, uh, it's exactly what I was thinking of. And I recently read, um, uh, I recently read the book, uh, Project Hail Mary. I don't know if any of you have read this, it's a science fiction book. But it's the most amazing description of a relationship between a scientist and an engineer, both from different planets. Uh, and, and I think it's such a, such a clear example of how they have to work together. All right, let's discuss another thing. In yes. visual thinking, I described a, a program called a, a, it's a marine innovation boot camp. And so you have marines that are truck drivers and degreed university trained engineers give them a pilot jump from the base and say, make a vehicle out of it. And the mechanics are much better at improvising a vehicle. The degree engineers didn't know where to start. So but you have to have both kinds of minds. Because right. my kind of thinkers, and a whole shop's full of them, we never messed with boilers in refrigeration. <laughs> That's for the mathematicians. The structural loading of the roof, we don't mess with that. You see, you have to have the whole team. That's it. That's it, exactly. And you mentioned specifically in your book uh, the tech industry, and Amy, we'll come to you in a moment about thinking about the tech industry, but I'm <laughs> not sure why that was funny, but you mentioned a couple of the really famous collaborations in tech, and I thought that was so interesting, right. like Steve Wozniak and, and Steve Jobs. Well, Steve Jobs was an artist, so he wanted a computer that looked nice, that be simple to use. Steve Wozniak wanted to put five expansion slots on it. I actually was looking it up the other, uh, the other night, and the first uh, Apple one was like in a briefcase. Uh, that's not very pretty. Where, where Steve Jobs worked on the interface. Also on the iPhone. Steve Jobs is an artist, he's not a cook. So he made an interface on the iPhone that was easy to use. And the mathematical engineers had to make it work. So that collaboration then later on happened with the iPhone, but uh, Wozniak wasn't involved with that. But that's different kinds of clients. And a lot of tech is horrible interfaces. That's right. Right now in farming, uh, I have a dairy client that's uh, got three different electronic uh, data gathering things like electronic 
interface for the milking machines with an accelerometer bracelet for lameness, and then another system. They're all different vendors, and you cannot integrate the data. It's hard. I was just there that last week. Uh, they, you have to use each program separately. You can't like go in and go, okay, is lameness affect milk production? Well, since they're different vendors, you can't run that stats. So being able to integrate these different systems requires people not only to be able to uh, work together, but talk to each other. Well, you've got to have an interface that the dairy can use. They spend a lot of money on this equipment, and they cannot integrate the data. And then during COVID, the dairy lent my student a laptop and entering the stuff from the different, different uh, systems on an Excel spreadsheet manually. I said, this is the most horrible mess I've ever seen. So you need my kind of mind for the interface. That's and right. a mathematical mind to make the programming work. That's so right. when you swipe the iPhone, it does that. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the, okay, Steve Jobs thinks up the swiping and the icons, and then the mathematicians have to make the phone actually work. Oh, that's such a great example. Great example. So, so Amy. <laughs> sophisticated. <laughs> I'm wrapping my head around it. Yes. But Amy, you in your own right have worked with many professionals who may need to understand to see the visual world better, like medical professionals and company executives. Have you seen how people work better or work better together by learning to see more? Yes, that's the short answer. Yes. <laughs> uh, in a nutshell, the way I introduce the idea of seeing, I use art as data. I use art as something that everybody can see and we don't have to know anything about it. You don't have to have an art degree, you don't have to know Monet versus Manet when, we're, when I'm working with you. What I'm trying to introduce in my book is to use art as a vehicle to think about how to see, how to think about what we see, and most importantly, how to talk about what we see. And where the value comes in, or where I have found the value in working across the professional spectrum, from shock and trauma nurses, nurses to Google executives to prison wardens, is that everybody sees something and that we gain value from understanding multiple perspectives. And my, the, the title of my first book, on which this book is based, is called Visual Intelligence. What is visual intelligence? It has two parts. Number one, seeing what other people don't, as Temple does, because I'm still wrapping my head around the sophisticated descriptions of what with the things that she has designed. But the second part of visual intelligence is gaining clarity from multiple perspectives and understanding that nothing is exactly the way you see it. Mm. Everybody sees things differently. You gave such a fantastic example in the book of a doctor looking at a patient's room differently after having been introduced to seeing things more. Do you remember this example? Will you, will you talk about it? Sure. It's brilliant. Sure. Uh, one of the things, when I work with medical students especially, they're just, you know, no filter on medical students. They have everything to learn. And I say to them, before you when you walk into a patient's room, before you pick up the chart, just look. Just pause five seconds, 10 seconds, and look around the room. What do you smell? What do you see? Are there flowers next to the patient? Is the patient wearing his or her own pajamas or a hospital gown? That tells you how long they might have been there, how they feel about being in the hospital. And maybe there's a book or a teddy bear or a balloon that tells you that that person has a connection to the outside world. And what that does is it gives you these multiple perspectives and informs the treatment that you're ultimately gonna prescribe for this patient. Knowing that there's someone out there in the world that can help with your medication or help with your diet planning rather than being all alone and no connection. So just looking at your patient dare I say it, as a human being, <laughs> before looking at your patient as a tumor or a stomach ulcer or an aneurysm can help in the overall treatment. That's a, such a great example that remembering to look is something that some of us have to remember to do. Now, you have both written about how a version, sorry, you've both written a version of how normal it is to ignore the details. Um, 
temple, if, if the autistic mind tends not to ignore the details, tends to see the details, then how might you motivate a kid on the autism spectrum to use these fixations on the details, to learn science and other skills? Well, first of all, you have to plug. When I was a very young kid, I just drew the same horse head over and over again. And mother said, let's draw the whole horse. Or let's say the kid's interested in cars. Let's read about cars, do math with cars. What you want to do is broaden. Now, they put a question in there to Amy, but I want to do a little bit of an answer to that one, too. That's good. How do you help kids to attend to visual details? Well, one of the things that helped me was when I took an animal behavior class, we had to spend four hours observing a single animal. And I also have that in my uh, children's book, Calling All Minds, where you go, and then also in the Outdoor Scientist, Outdoor Scientist book, where you just like pick out a squirrel and just observe everything it does. And I remember during the lockdown, we were, my, my students, we were eating in a gazebo and outside and watched a squirrel dig a hole for a nut. And then he, te he put the nut in his mouth so another squirrel would steal it, test the depth of the hole. It wasn't dig deep enough. So he put it back in his mouth and after about three tries, he got it deep enough and covered it. And sometimes just making you attend, you know, watching that single squirrel for a long period of time. I also had an art assignment, which I wish I still had, where each student had to take the shoe off. They're sitting in chairs like this and put the shoe in a three-quarter position with the toe kind of this way and spend two hours in pencil meticulously drawing that sneaker. A dirty tennis shoe is what I had. And I was amazed at what a great grubby tennis shoe I did. But that made me slow down. And then with drafting, you, uh, everything with me was hand drafting. You had to slow down when you used the ruler. And when I slowed down, that really made a difference. But that was the same thing as sketching the, the, uh, the sneaker is doing it very slowly and they didn't want us to race so I'd write very, you know, try to trace the sneaker. Uh, and I was amazed what a good grubby sneaker I did. I wish I still had it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just throw something in on that sneaker that I find fascinating and connected to my work? You made the point that you turn the sneaker around and that the toe face this yeah, way. I, yeah, Who draws right. a sneaker that way? And to see it from a different perspective gives you a whole well, other Well, I could have just put the sneaker down the other way. But what that, both those things did is it made me slow down. Okay, and then in a mythology class, uh, they said, well, you can't do cattle. So I went to the uh, Phoenix Zoo when I was at Arizona State, and I picked out the Oryx antelopes because they were in a big enclosure. I spent four hours watching them. And they did interesting sparring behavior through chain link fence mm -hmm. that lasted like maybe 15 seconds. So if I hadn't been there for four hours, I would not have seen that. And that was a really, really good assignment. Yeah. I think I'm really struck by looking at things takes time. Really looking at things and seeing what you're looking at takes time. Amy, how do you help kids to attend to more visual details? I think that's fascinating, right? If I'm going to draw my shoes, I'm going to draw them from this angle, right? Well, they made that the minister, they, they made us take them. Right, that's fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to start with a quote from an author who was here last year. Some of you may remember Frank Rooney was here. And Frank Rooney has a wonderful quote about the power of a pause. And I use it. I have to give him full credit. Uh, he said, a pause is when passions cool civility gets oxygen, and wisdom finds its wings. And I wish I could take credit for that. It's just it's such a beautiful, when passion's cool, civility gets oxygen, and wisdom finds its wings. And to segue from what Temple was talking about, wisdom finding its wings, you're gonna see things differently when you just stop. You just take a breath and say, well, that didn't go very well. How am I going to make sure that I don't do that again? Or that was awesome, how am I going to replicate that? But you need to pause. So to answer your question about how I get kids to think about slowing down and, and thinking about what they see, I'm going to use my own poor child as an example because this kid had to grow up with the art of perception, poor thing. And 
Every day that he would come home from school, we probably stopped this in high school, I'd ask two questions. Number one, what's something that caught your eye today? What's something that caught your eye that you found interesting? And he started to know that I was going to ask him this every day, so he'd come home with some crazy answer. I don't know if it really happened or not. But the second thing is a question that adds to your visual intelligence, getting on the other side of the issue. And it's called the pertinent negative. It's thinking about what you're not seeing. So I would say to Ian, what didn't happen today that you expected to? And he'd say, Mom, can I just have cookies and milk? Can I just, you know, can we just do what normal people do? But you know, it got to be a good exercise because what he didn't realize at the tender age of 11 is by thinking about what didn't happen and then having to communicate to me what didn't happen, he's engaging in a kind of neuroplasticity. You're not just seeing what happened, you're telling me what didn't happen. If you're, if you're out evaluating someone's performance, tell them what they did, but tell them what they didn't do so they can fix it. it. It helps your visual intelligence to say, well, I saw this in the data, but I didn't see this. So every day it was, well, what didn't happen today that you expected to, and what caught your eye today? Do you have a thought about that, Temple, or should we move on? Maybe we can move on. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for questions. Sure, we want to make sure we have time for questions. And it's only 1.20, okay, so we're good, good on time. Yes, unfortunately, I have a plane at, yes. at 5 o'clock, which I didn't have, wish I didn't have to be on. Uh, well, we wish you didn't wish you didn't have to be on. I didn't have any choice. <laughs> <laughs> Temple, you have written that autistic people often don't pay as much attention to social or emotional information. Do you think that autistic people may see differently in part because they filter out social or emotional information? Well, there's some things that we really need to think about extremely logically. Yeah. I'm appalled at some of the junk that people will do. Are there really aliens underneath the Denver airport? <laughs> <laughs> And, and I'm not going to use any of the controversial examples without getting me in trouble, but I don't think aliens at the Denver airport is uh, something that's going to get me in trouble. But some of the stuff that people believe. Now, the other thing I found is the visual thing. I'm a bottom-up thing. I think just like that uh, chat GPT things. I'm only as good as my training set. And when I was younger and I had less visual images in my database, I think I would have been more likely to believe something stupid like that and now I just go, that's complete rubbish. I know it's underneath there. A, a failed baggage handling system that they ripped out. <laughs> <laughs> and then I talked to him on the plane with Sean Associate. So now I'm on the plane yep. talking to a guy who had to fix the uh, internet cables under there. And he said, there's hundreds of bags that they lost. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay, so now we know. Now you know the real secret of the bottom of the deck. <laughs> Temple, both because we get to see how your mind works, right? We see associative links. It's associative links. There is a logic, but there are associative links where a verbal thinker is much more linear and tends to overgeneralize. I'll give an example, real world thing. Awesome. The power plants that froze in Texas. Yeah. And they talked about this in a very vague, abstract way. I never saw anybody talk about what piece of equipment froze at each point. Because if I know what piece of equipment froze, I can then rank them by cost and difficulty of winterizing. I never saw that in press. That's a fantastic example. But you make another point, which I think is incredibly important. We often think about autism in young people. We forget that autistic people are going to develop and grow in their own wisdom. Well, who do you think makes all the computers? Exactly. <laughs> talented shop people where a single welding class led to a large shop patenting all kinds of mechanical equipment. And they were either autistic, dyslexic, ADHD, and I've been out to the Silicon Valley companies, half those programs were on the spectrum. <laughs> sure. And I was in the academy technology Right. I have, I have to throw this in there because I do a lot of work in the intelligence community. I work with the FBI and I work with in all branches of the military. And there is a task force in Israel that is charged with one thing, they do topographical readings from drones. Drones that fly all over. 92% of the people on that task force are on the spectrum for autism. 
92% of them that read the topographical maps from drones are on the spectrum. Well, they, they just see detail in exactly. those maps. Exactly. Or the they see a very, very little change, or maybe a camouflage, and that might be yep. uh, the picture taken one day, the picture taken a week later. And, they're, and they they're see that. So their, their uh, incidence of error is so low that they, they just rely on this. Well, I also think it's interesting that facilities management is sponsoring us. That's right. <laughs> and, uh, and we rely on the normal object visualizers that are going to keep the air conditioning on in this building and the water system working, and they often don't get enough credit. That's such a visual intelligence. All right, right. thank you, facilities <laughs> management. Here, here. And I will tell you, during COVID, facilities management became critical workers on this campus. Yeah. They kept our air exchange moving. They decided what buildings had the right number of students in them that we could te teach in safely. Facilities management was amazing. So shout out to them. Yeah. Amy, you have suggested that if we make an effort, we can become aware of our perceptual filters. And can you give us some examples? My favorites were, seeing what we want to see or are told to see instead of what we're seeing. That's right. So perceptual filters, let's just start by saying that everyone has them. <laughs> everyone has them. It's like when someone says, well, I'm not biased. <laughs> Guess again. <laughs> everyone has biases and everyone has perceptual filters. And to add a third to that, uh, we have what we uh, want to see what we are told to see, and, to, and that we don't see change. We think things are gonna stay exactly the way they are. And to, just to give you a, a brief definition of perception, perception is your interpretation of what you observe. Okay, so, so it, objectivity, we talk about objective and subjective things that we observe. And you have to start by remembering that no two people see anything the same way, not through your eyes attached to your brain. And the best example I'm going to give you is when I do my training sessions in an art museum, I don't let anyone read the label. Why? Because the label is going to tell you what to look for in the work of art. And I want you to rely on your own inherent sense of observation because it's in there. And if someone tells you, I think in the book I use an example and I show a painting and I say, this is called white paint. Tell me what you see in the painting, and people describe it. And then I say, oh, no, no, we got the title wrong. It's white frosting. Well, that changes everything. <laughs> because frosting, you want to put your finger in it exactly, and you want to taste it. So reading a label is the best example of, of looking for what you're told to see. And that's where confirmation bias comes in. When, when a police officer gets to a crime scene and has heard the description of the crime scene on the radio on the way over, been there, done that, I know what I'm gonna look for. And in rushing to confirm what they think they're going to see, they miss what they need to see to find out what happened at the crime scene. You know, uh, this isn't on here, but you said in your book, you don't even just think in, in images, but in videos. Well, I can make little videos. I can actually test run equipment in my head and I've talked to some drafting technicians I've worked with that were highly visual thinkers, that after one semester drafting course, they'll lay the entire factories out. They could see the equipment still, but I can do a little video of it moving. And that probably enables you to see what will change. So I imagine that enables me to tell with maybe it might, whether it's working. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> or maybe what might break down in six months or something like that. Well, I guess I can see it. You know, you put too big a load on an overhead rail, it's going to yank it out of the ceiling. Yeah, right. eventually. Yeah. yeah. Which it did. <laughs> <laughs> well, what we don't see can literally kill us. And Temple, you have concerns about relying on sensors to alert us to danger instead of using the skills of visual thinkers. Can and you give actually, us it, this is not actually right, this question. Basically, what I've said in my book in the disasters chapter, engineers calculate risk that something will go wrong with something. Visual thinkers see risk. So I use the Fukushima nuclear power plant as an example. They did a perfect job of calculating the re reactor to withstand the shaking from the earthquake. But what they didn't see is the tsunami wave coming in, flooding the site, 
and drowning the emergency, uh, emergency cooling pump with its electric motor. And all I need to know about a reactor is if that pump doesn't run when I need it, it's totally horrible and it needed watertight doors. Simple watertight doors would have prevented it. That is pure visual thinking. And I also talked about the Boeing Max. I went on it yesterday. He's got fabulous luggage bins. <laughs> <laughs> and you can get everybody's bag on it. And uh, the, in the beginning of that, and I don't have time to explain the whole thing, it was visual thinking mistake. And they trusted a single delicate sensor uh, to uh, determine whether the plane's stalling. And then the automated system would shut the nose down and the pilots try to yank it back up. And I said, what happens if I just break the sensor? The default setting should be flight level and straight, not stall. Mm -hmm. And then it should have an indicator to return to the airport. Yeah. And it was missing the indicator because the plane has two of these things. So they wired the, the computer just to one sensor. And they didn't have the indicator that would tell you that one of them was broken. Yeah. And in the, in the beginning, it was a visual thinking mistake. Uh, they've got, uh, United's bought a whole bunch of Maxes. They're wonderful now. I'm not the least bit concerned about the problem. They have fixed it. But I found out after I wrote visual thinking, I sat on a plane next, on a Max actually, next to a Boeing engineer. And it turns out that a visual thinker in the shop warned them. I found that out from a Boeing engineer sat next to me on the plane. And, and it's not in the book, it's a book that was already written. The visual finger had warned them. It's, they just didn't see it. See, this is why you've got to have both kinds of minds. I can't, there's a whole bunch of aerodynamic stuff with the plane, it's all mathematical. But you have to have both. Yes. The training is so important as well, because I think of that pilot who set down the plane on the river in New York, he was an older pilot, and he was used to having been trained. He was also trained. a glider pilot. Exactly. So he was trained not to read sensors, but to read the environment as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I didn't like the way that movie pre presented him. Uh, read the book. Read Sullenberg's book. And one of the really interesting things is he had perceptual slowing. Because when they played the voice recorder back, he thought he had twice as much time. Actually had perceptual slowing. That's fascinating. Mm. Amy, you help to train people to think about what I don't see, like you said to your son. Mm -hmm. How can observing in this way help us in these dangerous types of situations? Any examples? Yeah, I do have an example uh, on the flip side of what, just, of what Temple just talked about. I train people in threat assessment. And threat assessment is a wide swath in our world, as you can imagine, from planes to school shootings, to you know, threats in hospitals and all kinds of threat assessment. And what is particularly interesting is what happens when we have to go from threat assessment to threat management, what triggers that? Is it something you see? Is it something you sense? Is it people say, well, I just got a bad feeling. Well, what does that mean? I just got a bad feeling about what? What do you have a bad feeling? It's like when someone says, hmm, that's fascinating. What? What's fascinating? We need to choose our words when it comes to threat assessment and threat management. And I'm not talking about litigious concerns. Mark Twain has a wonderful quote. He said, finding the right word is really a big deal because it could be the difference between a lightning bug and lightning. It's a big deal. Words, words really matter. And to give you one of the worst examples in my lifetime, I was in New York City on 9-11. I was there and I watched those towers fall and I'm not exaggerating when I tell you I think of it every single day, every day. When I leave, when I get on a plane, if I get on the subway, I think about that because it, has, it had never happened before and hopefully will never happen in my life. But what the intelligence community says, that it was not an intelligence failure, it was a failure of the imagination. And it was a failure of what we could not see in our visual thinking. We could not imagine that people would use flights to drive them into planes. So what we see and how we think about threats and shifting from threat assessment to threat management involves the imagination, which is why I it use involves art. Seeing. Yes. Okay, power grid uh, damage, 
Uh, this is something that's sensitive. I'm not going to tell you all the details. It's extremely fragile. And there's been some people that have attacked stuff. And I'm seeing that equipment right now. It's very easy to wreck. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, but I've worried about it for years. And now there's some people doing it. Temple, you're talking about attacking power stations, aren't you? Yeah, as a way to disrupt. Attacking power equipment. I'm not going to go into any more details. Now, when it comes to 9 11, um, I watched it on live television when it went down. And I'm going, that building should not collapse. See, my engineering side kicked in. It, it had great tensile strength. But when I looked at the drawings that were published two weeks later, and the Chicago Trib published them, not the New York Times, and I looked at how that's constructed, I can tell you why that came down. You know what happens to a supermarket roof when it has a fire? It's, it's wet spaghetti, like, you know, right. like this. That building had no uh, vertical concrete in it. The fasteners were too weak. Wow. That should not have collapsed. Mm -hmm. And they will never use that design for a high-rise building ever again. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at it from an engineer, uh, engineering standpoint. I said something was wrong with that building mm -hmm. from a technical standpoint. Mm -hmm. It was cheap and made for ease of fabrication. And you know, on the flip side of that as well, thinking about the design of the building, one of the things that I teach using works of art is situational awareness. Where are you? How did you get there? Who's around you? And how do you get out? And most importantly, how do you communicate that situational awareness? And when a threat happens, I got to train my poor son again. I got to train my son in situational awareness. I said to him the first time he took the New York City subway, I said, every time those doors open, I need you to look around. I want you to see who got on, who got off. No headphones in your ears and no looking at videos. Yeah, I'm sure that lasted a long time. But, but the idea of situational awareness, where are you at any particular moment, involves visual thinking and seeing to place yourself. And so we use that when we're looking at a work of art and I'll say, well, where are you in the painting? Are you looking in? Is someone looking out at you to be able to articulate situational well, awareness? Well, I'm looking at right now where I'd go in a tornado in a major airport. And I spent so much time in airports, that's why I use those examples. I can think of a glass rotunda, uh, you're going to be you know, guillotined with broken glass. They're, they have the bathrooms as shelters. The people won't all fit in the bathrooms. I'm going to head for the back storeroom of some of the shops. I've already figured out where I'm going to go. Follow Temple. Follow Temple. If something happens in the airport, follow you. I'm right with you. In the back room of the restaurant as gas stove. No. Stores, I would go in the back of the shop. Can yeah. I tell you, I, and this is absolutely on point to what you just said, if you don't mind. No. Uh, in the Westgate Mall, Nairobi, Kenya, to September 2013, a woman came to the mall that morning and brought her children to a cooking class, like a Williams Sonoma. You have Williams Sonoma out here. So they had a cooking class. And when the Al Shabaab militants came in and started their attack, that woman knew when she came in that the counter at the kitchen where they were working was fortified by another counter and had a wall. And she took her children and she hit, she put them on the floor and she sang to them for five hours. And they survived. And 68 other people didn't. And when I read the aftermath of that uh, terrorist attack, people came to the shopping mall. They found people in air shafts in the mall. They found them in pizza ovens that hadn't been lit up yet. And I thought, who goes to a mall thinking about the air shafts? Temple does. And you know what? I will too. Because their situational awareness kicked in and it saved their lives. But I've also thought about it beforehand because there's a lot of tornadoes. And I'm like, in, in, in Denver Airport, for example, there's a huge glass rotunda in, in the middle of each terminal. I certainly don't want to be there. And so if I have a tornado, and we've had some, uh, we we'll start hitting the airport, but the bathrooms are full. Where am I going to go? You want to find another place where it's a small space with strong walls, which the back store of a store would be. Perfect. We will all remember this. I'm no, just going to say. all remember this. Next time you're in an airport, you know where to go. So I have one question left for each of you. Uh, it's 1.40, so we still have five minutes, and then we'll, we'll start questions. I'm going to start with Amy, and then I'm going to turn to Temple. So Amy... You, well, you are each very interested in education and how to teach young people. Can you tell us what you think is missing from our education right now for visual thinkers or in terms of arts education? Yes, uh, I, it's, it's 
As I've watched over the years, I know STEM education is so important, but I've watched the arts decline and decline and decline. And because what good is painting in the fifth grade when you need to get certain test scores? So the idea that art and music and dance can all be used for that neuroplasticity, and I wish people had the vision to know that using the arts and teaching young people to engage in the process of looking and dancing and playing instruments and listening to music their brain responds in a way that it doesn't to any other stimuli. And that that neuroplasticity can be applied to anything else they choose to do. And you don't have to be a, you know, you don't have to be a concert master just listening to music and understanding music. So the role of the arts in schools, I want to see it come back and not decline. Yeah. Same question to you, Jeff. Totally, totally agree with that. But I also want to put back in sewing, cooking, woodworking, welding, auto shop. Because one of the reasons why this equipment's being made in Holland now is because we're paying the price now for taking those classes out. And we've got people growing up today totally removed from the world of practical. I have a student in my class who had never used a ruler. And they got to make policy about really important stuff like water and power plants. Yeah. So I'm going to really add, I think that is so important. And I'm also going to add, I'm going to sound like a dinosaur. Let's get rid of gender. Boys don't have to take shop and girls take. Yeah. Right. I don't know, take home that. Let's all take shop. everything. I was the second girl in my elementary school to take shop and pick. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate this. So I grew up in rural Montana, and I think this is a place where rural education is incredibly important. In the seventh grade, we took fly tying. I joke not. And we took hunter safety. Talk about situational awareness. And I was not allowed to take drafting, but my father knew drafting, taught me the basics, took me back to school and said, this girl can be in your drafting class because she already knows the basics. So I thought you'd appreciate that. <laughs> I do, I do. And, and but this whole being removed from the world of practical, I think is really, really concerning. Mm -hmm. And we've got so many important things to, uh, to solve in the future. Put those classes all back in. Yeah. Some states are starting to do it because I'm traveling around talking about this. The other thing about the arts, a scientist who's involved with the arts is more likely to win a Nobel Prize. Oh, and that's in my visual thinking book. Well, these are both incredible books, and I now want to have an opportunity for some questions. So I'm going to let both the authors take a drink of water if they'd like to <laughs> have a moment. Um, what we're going to do is go ahead and raise hands. I'm going to repeat your question because there are not microphones in the audience. And so that means if you'll ask your question, kind of the essence of your question, I'll repeat it and then one of the speakers will answer. Does that sound like a good plan? Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Hands for people who have questions. Yes. So I'm just going to repeat the, sorry, the essence of the question. In an active shooter situation, this woman was able to have situational awareness, but is asking about how do you communicate that to other people to keep them safe as well? We just got to tell them what to do. <laughs> and whatever you think the appropriate thing is. Get down, run, you know, whatever. Barricade the door. You know, that's, uh, just give a command and try to get them to do it. I, I, Temple's absolutely right, but one step that I would insert in there is to say out loud, I'm, I'm in charge of the situation. Say it out loud. Because if nobody is taking charge, take charge out loud and say, because people freeze. And adrenaline takes, it takes many different roles. And if you say, 
I want you to listen to me right now. The two people at the window, I want you to step back and I want you to get on the floor. Clear, concise, objective information and trying to keep a monotone but announce that you are in charge. If there is no police officer in there, if there's no first responder in there, take charge. Okay. If I can add one thing, if it's all right. We also all have to recognize that we have different skills. My partner, who's former military and is a visual thinker, uh, I trust him on the tube in London. If he says move, I move. I have been in London way more times than he has, but he has an awareness I don't. So I would only add, you can say, I'm military trained and I'm in charge here, or I'm a doctor and I'm in charge here, or I taught kindergarten and I'm in charge here. <laughs> of mass shootings and trauma situations. I, I'm sorry to, to even bring these up, but these are the people I work with. In Uvalde, nobody took charge. Nobody took charge. And so we all react differently, and as Mary Frantz had said, everyone has different skills, and the person that can rise and say, you're gonna listen to me, that gives everyone a sense of comfort, and they will do what you say. Great. Other questions from the audience? I see two hands back there. Everything is important in space because things move quickly and it's important. Visual thinking is important in space. I think this is the question. In what way do you think, Temple, that visual awareness will be so important in space flight? Well, let's look at the invention of the space suit. It was uh, invented by Playtex, the bra company. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that is true. And, uh, Yep, there was all that. There's a book called Space Suit. It's kind of a boring book, but you dig into the, you know, there's a few juicy parts about how the engineers, uh, and mathematical engineers, kind of fought with the designers of Playtex. But you see, that would have been pure visual thinking. Obviously, Playtex didn't make the hand. But all of the, all of the backpack, but all the soft parts of the space suit were made by Brown. It's very interesting. Another question from the audience. That's the moon suit version. Don't be shy. Ah, excellent. We have a question back here. Um, so, is you consider the example of the Uvalde shooting to be the first Can you give an example of how you use artwork to train physicians? And I will tell you, this book is incredible. <laughs> Thank you. I'm gonna, uh, I, I'm gonna switch. Well, I'll give you two examples. I'll get, you'll get two for the price of one question. In the first case, I'm gonna give you the example of radiologists. And I was privileged and honored to work at the Frick Collection in New York City for 12 years. And it really laid the groundwork for what I'm doing now. And when I had radiologists in, we used to look at the pictures of Vermeer. And we have one beautiful Vermeer that has two figures, and it's dark in the background. And one of the radiologists said to me, when I'm looking at films, I can't just look at what's there, I have to see what's not there. So the idea of that pertinent negative with doctors, and also with doctors, patients don't necessarily speak doctor language. We have to make sure that doctors are communicating, know what they want to say and know what they don't want to say. So when they're looking at a work of art and they'll, they'll point to a subject and say, well, she looks depressed. Depression is a clinical diagnosis. We're looking at someone in a painting. Is she not smiling? Is she hunched over? How do we distinguish between a diagnosis and what we want to reach for and what it is we actually see? And one other example I'm going to give you because it just fascinated me. Uh, I train special operations Navy SEALs in art museums. And I assigned two SEALs to this large sculpture at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And I saw them walk around the back and it didn't, they were talking about the sculpture from all angles. And I said, how did you know that you could access the sculpture from the back? And he said, it's like landmines. We watch what other people do, and if they go there safely, we can go safely. 
in an art museum. <laughs> so they're orienting themselves to the sculpture and thinking about walking around something and seeing it from every angle. Don't forget I use art as data. Brand new data because I believe the best things happen on the exit ramp of your comfort zone. Take them out of their comfort zone, give them brand new data, and make them excel. Well, I want to mention that uh, uh, one of the problems that they're having training doctors today is to teach them how to sew up cuts because they've never used a needle and thread. <laughs> and, and that's why I did my other kids' book, Calling All Minds. I mean, I was horrified when I did a book signing for that five years ago that anywhere from 20 to 30% of the children in, outside of Denver have never made a paper airplane. This totally being a work away from the world of the practical, I think is really bad. A question in front of you. Yes. I have read that images, particularly paintings, give off a, a, a vibration of their own. Is that something you've studied? The question is, do images, she's read, give off vibrations of some sort? I'm the first to tell you when I have no idea. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you I have no idea. I, I, I will say that certain works of art resonate with some people. I come away from a work of art, and I'm not exaggerating when I say they can take my breath away. There's an aura from a work of art that I would get, but it, that is not the same for everyone. I've never experienced a particular vibration from a work of art. That's not to say that it doesn't exist. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, I've never experienced that. But again, the experience with a work of art is highly individualized. It's really that communication, isn't it, between you and the artist, even though the artist came long before. A question here. Yeah, um, about uh, the temple agreement. Uh, with your squeeze machine that you have invented, does it have a sound effect that makes it sound like you're in a temple? Well, deep pressure, the question concerning the squeeze machine that I invented, I had horrible problems with anxiety, and deep pressure can be calming, and I, it's actually referenced in a lot of patents, like for the dog thunder shirt. Yeah. Uh, There's more question questions. Was, yeah. how, how did you imply that? Like, how did you know it would help calm the animals? Well, actually, I got the idea from watching an existing squeeze shoot that's used to hold cattle for vaccination. I did not invent that. That that had been around for years. I had watched the cattle go through that and got the idea. A visual observation. That it was a visual yeah. observation. I always got to mention one other thing. I've gotten into some hassles with some of the academics who will say, well, the only thing that's real science is have a hypothesis do a controlled experiment. And then I said, well, observation is part of science because you have to do observation in order to form a hypothesis. And I used to fight with my old uh, thesis professor, and I said, Stan, what's the Hubble Space Telescope? It's observation. And the single most important picture the Hubble took of all the galaxies. The scientist spent 10 days of precious observing time pointing at nothing, and he found everything. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. We have a few more minutes. Is there another question in the center? Are there any types of visual thinking you like doing just for fun, like daydreaming? <laughs> oh yes, I have daydream when I, when I design equipment. And then when I read a book, I tend to like books with lots of description. It's like watching a movie. You know, but a science fiction book and they're describing something, it comes up as a, a movie. As a cognitive scientist, I like to think about the fact that daydreaming is associational thinking. It is. Because you're not intending toward a goal. And so there's nothing linear but about I, it. But I find lots of times when I'm trying to figure out how to design a piece of equipment, it comes when the brain is idle. It's called the default circuits in the brain. So I'm taking a shower or driving on open theme freeway something, and then all of a sudden, the idea comes, this is how to solve it. I'm gonna problem. throw something in there also, because I've recently discovered this. My greatest clarity and my most creative thoughts happen in the middle of the night. Yeah. In the yeah. middle of the night, like two o'clock in the morning. And I've come up, and this is a spoiler alert, I thought of my fourth book about a month ago, in the middle of the night, and I've started, this is so nerdy, but I've started to keep a notebook and a pen next to the bed, and I just scribble it down because when I wake up, it's gone because I'm worried about who's made the coffee and what am I gonna get out. And the, I really believe that when the brain is clear of those distractions, the best thoughts come to you. No, that's right, and when you're totally relaxed, 
That's when the ideas come. I find for me sometimes they come just as I'm falling to sleep. Now I tend to not forget them. <laughs> I want to be you. I want to be you. I, I no. want to remember all those things that I can. I'm going to work on that. I can, you know, I just see instead of especially something, you know, the problem solving sort of thing. The other thing, I had an interesting time. Uh, I gave a talk at Expedia, it's corporate headquarters, talking about you know disability access at the airport and stuff. And there was a lot of theoretical talk. And the blind person there goes, you know what really is hard for me at the airport? It's finding gates on long concourses. So I immediately visualized gate finding mm. on the phone. And as it walks through the airport, the gates will speak to them. A61, A62. And, I, and then I've also thought about different ways you could, different platforms you could put it on that I'd have to have the mathematicians design. But I don't think in abstractions. I'm going, all right, let's make something for the blind person. To make it easier, and it just came to my flash like yeah. picture. That's fantastic. Yeah. Additional questions. Uh, one here, and then you. This, the gentleman here in the red hat. Uh, yes, I, I like your ideas about visual things and that, but I, I, work, I work in software, and a lot of what I tend to help has helped me innovate and, and almost figure out. Stuff. Yes. Yes. So he's saying that as a software engineer, he imagines the whole graphical flow. And there There's more of a pattern. We'll illustrate that for you. Yes. And it helps tremendously. What will help you illustrate that? There are tools that will. Tools. That will take, take software and you know, draw out the. This is fascinating because, Timbal, I think you do this naturally. You see the flow, but there are tools that some of us can use to help us to but do also, that. But also, the more mathematical mind thinks in patterns. Yes. And I knew a programmer, and she said, I could see the whole program tree. It was like looking at a pattern. And I think in pictures. So I come up with something like Gatefinder app, <laughs> but then I'm going to have to have a uh, a, a programmer work on how to do it. Do I use transponders for the platform? Can I use an AI platform? I think I've got to use transponders. Uh, so the gates signal the phone. I'm going to just underscore that and tell you that when, when I do my teaching, uh, there are no words in my PowerPoint presentations. It's all visual images because everyone sees something. People attach gravity and they start to see patterns and and have pattern recognition, and then they apply it to their own work. Because have you ever been read to from a screen? Yeah. Yeah. It's deadly. Yeah. It's deadly, and you want to say, I can read. But when you put paintings up, and you put patterns and photographs that have their own patterns, people take those images with them and learn to apply that to whatever the work is that they're doing. So that's really good to hear. The time is 1.58, and I think we're going to have one uh, final question, I promised, in the front. Well, I think one of the, see, a certain very, very extreme mathematical thinking or picture thinking, like there's the, you know, individual differences in people. I am very concerned that strong object visualizers that can't do algebra are screened out of medicine and screened out of a lot of things because they can't do abstract math. And the people that are pushing all these math courses, like for a veterinarian or a doctor, uh, they say you need algebra for logical thinking. That is not how I think. You see, and we're, and we're losing those thinkers. That's something I'm very, very concerned about. Yeah. I'm going to just add one quick thing to that, and a tool that you can give to yourself to just check yourself, to pause and check yourself, 
is to know that as a, as a person, as a human being, and as a medical student, you can't see everything. You just can't. So to remember that multiple perspectives make for better decision making, and to reach out to a colleague and just ask this simple question. Is, here's my patient, this is what I'm doing, and then you ask this question, is there something here I'm missing? And by doing that, someone will say, well, what about this? And you'll say, you know, I would have never thought of that. And you went from this to this, and it's a check on your own self-care to know, A, you're never gonna see anything, B, there are things hiding in plain sight, and bring in the value of multiple perspectives to help you make better decisions. I think that's a wonderful place to end. Thank yeah. you, Ashley. Central Mall. If we can clear the room quickly so the next panel can set up. Mall